All right, Father, we come before you right now by the precious blood of the Lamb. We thank you again for the honor of gathering together on your holy Shabbat. Father, open the eyes of our understanding as we study your word. Enlighten us to the hope of your calling, and I thank you for it, Father. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hashem Yeshua, Mishiachenu, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Turn this fan off real quick. All right, the message today is called Christianity has failed. And you could say Judaism has failed. Every religion on the face of the earth has failed. In the beginning, we were given a mission. God created mankind for a purpose. He wanted companionship. He wanted somebody like himself that he could fellowship with, that he could share his life with. But then he gave us a job. Genesis 125, it says, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, there's a lot of teachings going around right now where Yahweh's talking, referring to his council in heaven, where we know from the 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 stories that, I mean, Satan was walking to and fro on the face of the earth and appeared in the book of Job before the father. And there was a council there. When Micaiah, the one prophet, was giving the rendition why all the prophets of Israel were wrong and he alone got the correct word, there was a lying spirit in the council of the father. A lying spirit. The devil appears before him and there's this lying spirit. It says, I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. So Yahweh has a council and they're not always good. Some of them are evil spirits. But they all have to follow what Yahweh tells them to do. And they all have to run everything by him. And if they've got a legal right to do it, like in the book of Job, he has to give them permission. Job said, the thing that I have greatly feared has come upon me. Great fear cancels out faith, and it opens the door to the enemy. The enemy had a legal right to go in and shipwreck Job's life because he was in great fear. And the Father wants us in faith, not in fear. Anyway, this council, we're not made in the image of angels, and we're sure not made in the image of demons, fallen angels. So this council that is, he's talking about, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, it's the plurality of our creator. He is a triune being, and he created us in his image and his likeness. We're one individual. We wouldn't say we're schizophrenic or we're, talking, we're, we're weird because we're, we're a spirit. We have a soul, our personality, and we live in a body. We're a three-part being. Yahweh created us in his image and his likeness. That's how he is. But he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeshua is like the body of Elohim. The Father is like the soul. He's the one that makes the decisions. He's the personality of Elohim. And the Holy Spirit is like that life force that carries it out. Plus, he joins the, the two realms of physical and spiritual. It's the Holy Spirit that joins that gap. The Father's sitting in the throne in heaven. He's never been to this realm. When he comes on the scene, everything melts. His glory is so intense. This realm has never actually witnessed the presence of the Father. It's always been Yeshua, the Son that man has always interacted with. When Adam walked with Yahweh in the cool of the day, it was Yeshua. When, when Yahweh appeared to Abraham with the two angels that went and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that was Yeshua. It was not the Father. Because when the Father comes back, the elements melt with fervent heat. That's what 2 Peter 3 is talking about. In Revelation chapter 20, it talks about at the great white throne, how that heaven and earth fled from his face and there was no more place found for them because his intense his glory emanates from his face basically you can't see my face and live he told Moses his glory is so intense that it melts everything when he actually shows up on the scene in his full glory that is not hindered Yeshua had the full glory within him but his physical body acted as an insulator and that's why we were able to interact with Yahweh and not melt Yeshua in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily if he didn't have that body, it would have destroyed everything because the, this earth can't contain that. We have to have glorified bodies to be in the presence of the Father so that we won't melt. We have to have a new heavens and a new earth made of glorified material so we can be with his presence and it doesn't just melt everything. It's coming. So when he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, he and the Son are having a discussion here. And then the Son is the one that actually implemented it at the Father's request. And then it says, let them have dominion. And this is not optional. This is a commandment. This is the first commandment in all of Scripture for mankind. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over 
the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In his own image. Not in the image of angels or fallen angels or anything else. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. This is not an option. This was our commandment. This was our mission, our assignment. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth, and that includes serpents. We were commanded to have dominion and to subdue this realm. And Adam was the first to fail in his mission. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. But he was the stupidest one, too, because he's the one that yielded to the, serp to the enemy. The devil wasn't a snake. The devil was a, a cherub, cherub. It talks about the anointed cherub that covers. The snake was a physical body that he had to enter to be able to interact in this physical realm with physical people to be able to physically interact. So the serpent let him use his body. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And that was the first lie ever committed, because Yahweh did not say, you can't touch it, lest you die. She lied. We don't know if Adam misled her or if she just decided to add to the word, but this was the first fence around the Torah, the first oral law that was wrong, and it was a lie. And the serpent had something to work with then. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, not for touching it. And that was the truth. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In that aspect, that was actually true. But it was still a deception. It was geared to get her to disobey her creator and her lover. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. This guy's here letting his woman be deceived and he says nothing, but he eats the fruit. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of Yahweh Yahweh's mentioned in Genesis 3 the first time. It's yod heh vav in the Torah. He wants us to know his name. God, walking in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh. God among the trees of the, among the, trees of the garden. Then Yahweh, God, called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said to him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You see all the buck passing here? Nobody wants to take responsibility. So Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed. More than all cattle. See, the curse was put on the serpent, but it was also put on the devil at the same time. And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go. The devil doesn't crawl around on his be belly. He's an angel of light. He appears and looks like Yahweh sometimes, sounds like Yahweh. It's the physical snake that got the curse too. And you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now it jumps over into the spiritual as well. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, con your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. 
and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So there's a concept of spirit and truth that Yeshua shares with the woman at the well in Samaria, the physical and the natural. Usually in Scripture, <clears throat> you can find a physical application for these concepts and a spiritual application. Just like with this serpent, he was a physical being, a physical animal, but he was possessed by the devil himself. And so they both got cursed because the devil will not inhabit something that will not give it permission to. You have to he has no right to overpower anybody's will he has no ability to overpower their will he can tempt them he can deceive them but he can't make them make the wrong choice the snake did it willingly now we were all in the loins of adam when he sinned that concept we understand from hebrews chapter 7 when it talks about levi paid tithes to melchizedek because he was in the loins of abraham but he wasn't going to be born for a while he was the child of Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson. So he was the great-grandson of Abraham. Yet, he paid tithes to Melchizedek, because he was in the loins of Abraham, who actually did pay tithes to Melchizedek. So just like that, when Adam sinned, the whole human race was in his loins. When Yahweh breathed that breath of life into Adam, it was the whole thing. And when Adam sinned, that curse came upon the whole human race, because we were all in his loins. And that's why the whole human race was affected. And this is why Yeshua, our Messiah, had to be born of a virgin to bypass the curse of Adam's children. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, there again, there's a physical application of this prophecy in Isaiah's time. It's talking about his son in one aspect of it. But yet in the spiritual application, it's talking about our Messiah, Yeshua. And it says the virgin shall conceive. Obviously, Isaiah's wife was not the virgin. Alma is the Hebrew, and it could be translated young maiden. But the Greek word, when they translated the Septuagint, they use the Greek word for virgin. It can only be virgin. And it's the same in the Gospels, that in the Greek Gospels that we have anyway. So there's no question. Mary was a virgin. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And Yahweh himself, his seed, was placed in her womb. She was an incubator. So Yeshua was placed in Mary's womb so that he bypassed the curse. Even though she was the incubator, the curse came through the seed of the man. So God got out of that cycle and inserted sinless seed inside the woman so that he could be the last Adam and have the same chance that the first Adam had with no sin nature and no pull of the flesh. But he would be tempted just like the first Adam was and even above and beyond. The first Adam didn't fast for 40 days before he was tempted by the top guy. But Yeshua was. Now, we would again have to make a choice. Are we going to follow the seed of the woman, or are we going to follow the sin nature and the religions that the sin nature and the serpent produce as a result? The false religion. Eat of the tree and you can have eternal life. That was the first false religion ever invented. And you can see how that ended. Well, look at Jeremiah 23, 1. Now, I want to preface this with this message is going to be very hard against shepherds and rabbis, those that are in charge of Yahweh's children. He loves the children. He loves the people. They're being deceived. But to the shepherds, the ones that have placed themselves in that place of authority, this is who he's talking to. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away and have not attended to them. But they're still coming to your church every Sunday. But what have you driven them from? The forever settled word of Yahweh that Yeshua himself lived by and defeated the enemy by. 
You've driven your, the people away from Yahweh's word, who is Yeshua. He's the word made flesh. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares Yahweh. Pastor, you might have good intentions. You might have learned this garbage that you're teaching at seminary. But if it wasn't what Yeshua taught, you're teaching lies. Yeshua lived the perfect example. And please hear me. Yahweh's going to judge you. I am not your judge. I'm just sharing what his word says. But you will stand before him one day and he will hold you accountable for everything you taught his people. If it was not 100% from his word and Yeshua's example showing that's what we're supposed to do, you will be held accountable. And you're not going to like the result. So please repent now. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares Yahweh. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his day... In his days, Judah will be saved. Judah's not saved right now. There's a remnant. But most of Judah is lost. And Israel will dwell securely. Israel's still scattered in all the nations right now, for the majority of them. Some have come back. And this is the name which he will be called, Yahweh, our righteousness. Yeshua is Yahweh. When he comes back in Zechariah 14, we're about to look at it and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. It says yod heh vav heh does that in the Hebrew. It is Yahweh. Yeshua is Yahweh. Yahweh, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when they will no longer say, as Yahweh lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt. And that was through dividing the Red Sea, the ten plagues, miracles, wiping out the, the biggest army on earth, some pretty spectacular stuff but it's going to be dwarfed by what's coming. You'll no longer say, as Yahweh lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as Yahweh lives, who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I had driven them. Then they will live in their own soil. As for the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I've become like a drunken man, even like a man overcome with wine, because of Yahweh and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. For the land mourns because of the curse, the curse that Adam brought on the whole human race. We have to choose. Are you going to walk as a cursed human following after the sin of Adam? Or are you going to walk after the last Adam, Yeshua, who came and did it right? The pastures of the wilderness have dried up. Their course also is evil, and their might is not right. For both prophet and priest are polluted. Pastor, he's talking to you. Rabbi, he's talking to you. Even in my house, I have found their wickedness, declares Yahweh. Therefore, their way will be like slippery paths to them. They will be driven away into the gloom and fall down in it. For I will bring calamity upon them. The year of their punishment, declares Yahweh. And it's both the Christian church and rabbinic Judaism. Because Christianity mainly is a religious system that is kind of spun off of the northern kingdom's perverted worship with the golden calves. And so he says, moreover, among the prophets of Samaria, to Samaria Christians, I saw an offensive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray because if you're born again and you're in Yeshua, you are part of Israel. You've been grafted into the body of the perfect Jew, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you're not a Gentile anymore. But it doesn't mean you've made it. You've got to walk this thing out your whole life and endure until the end as we're going to see. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. Also, among the prophets of Jerusalem, the Jews, I have seen a horrible thing. The committing of adultery and walking in falsehood. 
and they strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one has turned back from his wickedness. The homosexual community in Judaism is astounding, even in Orthodox. You can be a homosexual and be a rabbi, but you can't be a believer in Yeshua and be a rabbi, according to them. It's twisted. All of them have become to me like Sodom and their inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts concerning the prophets. Behold, I am going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous waters. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth into all the land. Judaism, you failed. You were supposed to be a light to the nations. You rejected the Messiah. Now you teach against them. When he came and he laid his life down for your sin so that you could be with the father. Because no one can go there directly. You have to have a high priest. And he is the high priest after the order of Melech Zadik. Thus says Yahweh of hosts. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. Reject the lies of the rabbis is what he's saying. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination. Not from the mouth of Yahweh. They keep saying to those who despise me. This is Christians who reject his Torah and Jews who reject Yeshua. Both groups. He's addressing both. Yahweh said, you will have peace. And as for everyone who walks in stubbornness of his own heart, they say calamity will not come upon you. They're lying to Yahweh's people. But who has stood in the council of Yahweh? That he should see and hear his word. Who has given heed to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of Yahweh has gone forth in wrath. Even a whirling tempest. It will swirl down on the head of the wicked. And you are wicked if you're teaching against his word in any area. If you're teaching his law was nailed at the cross, you're a liar. And you're wicked according to Yahweh. You might not intentionally be saying lies, but you are. Because... What was nailed to the cross, if you look it up in the Greek, was the chorographon. It was the condemning sentence for breaking the Torah. It wasn't the Torah itself. It was our condemnation that was nailed to the cross. The penalty for our sin was nailed to the cross. In Yeshua, he took it all for us. But he lived the Torah as an example for us to follow. The anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purpose of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it as you're going through it. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God who is near, declares Yahweh, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in a hiding place so that I do not see him? declares Yahweh. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares Yahweh. I have heard what the prophets have said who are prophesying falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another? just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal, they're teaching false religious systems. Yahweh put what he wanted in his book and Yeshua operated in it. Go back to his example. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. His word trumps a vision. Peter's vision did not change the fact that pigs are unclean and you're putting that crap in the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're defiling the body that God gave you by not keeping it holy and set apart. Amen. What does straw have in common with grain, declares Yahweh? Is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. They don't get it from the Lord. They get it from one another. They go online and figure out what sermon am I going to teach this week? Or they go to seminary and learn about how to be a preacher. And it's a big job for them. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, 
who use their tongues and declare. The Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares Yahweh, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boastings. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares Yahweh. They tickle their ears, but it is not a benefit. Now, when this people or the prophet or a priest asks you, saying, what is the oracle of Yahweh? And you shall say to them, what oracle? Yahweh declares, I will abandon you. Then it's for the prophet or the priest or the people who say the oracle of Yahweh. I will bring punishment upon the man and his household. You claim to be his prophet and you're not teaching his Torah too. You're a liar and Yahweh's going to deal with you. You're misleading his people. You're lying about him and it's in your Bible. Read your Bible and do what Yeshua did. Thus will each of you say to his neighbor and to his brother, what has Yahweh answered? What has Yahweh spoken? For you will no longer remember the oracle of Yahweh because every man's own word will become the oracle. And you have perverted the words of the living God, Yahweh of hosts, our God. It's in the book. Say what he said, not what you believe. Read it verbatim. Look at how Yeshua did it. This is what he desires. Thus you will say to the prophet, what has Yahweh answered you? And what has Yahweh spoken? For if you say the oracle of Yahweh, surely thus says Yahweh, because you said this word, the oracle of Yahweh, I have also sent to you saying, you shall not say the oracle of Yahweh. Therefore, behold, I will surely forget you and cast you away from my presence along with the city which I gave you and your fathers. He's talking Jerusalem. I will put an everlasting reproach on you and an everlasting humiliation which will not be forgotten. This is his precious city, but it's been defiled by the defiled prophets and priests. And he said, he warned that the land would spew you out if you don't stay with my Torah. And that's what happened. Yahweh is about to deal with those who reject his Messiah and for those who reject his Torah. He's going to have more mercy on the people that have been lied to. But you pastors, he's going to deal with you because you are teaching his people. You have the book. You went to school. You learned the languages. You have no excuse. You have the example of Yeshua himself. And he's going to have to deal with the city. And then he shows us what he's going to do in Zechariah 14. Verse 1. Behold, the day of Yahweh is coming. And your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Yahweh is bringing the armies of the earth against Jerusalem because of the wickedness of the lying priests and prophets. The city shall be taken. The house is rifled. The women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go forth. Now, this is after 42 months of the Gentiles treading underfoot the holy city, which we see in Romans or Revelation 11, if you want to check that out. And then it comes back. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Remember, it says Yahweh in the Hebrew. This is Yeshua, but he's coming back as Yahweh with his authority. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved towards the north and half towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. This is the place we're told to flee to. This is our first location. If you're going to be in the place of protection. But if you're not over here for this time, you won't be able to. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus Yahweh, my God, will come, and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem. 
living waters. See, they're trying to destroy the earth right now. They're not just destroying the economies, like Brother Steve said. They've literally sprayed crap in our air through these chemtrails that is a lot of aluminum stuff. They're trying to manipulate the weather. They're trying to stop global warming. Well, they're just making ultraviolet radiation stream through is what they're doing. The sun is feeling hotter because it is. They're destroying the earth. There's microscopic layers of plastic in all the oceans killing the fish and, and, and bees are dying. I mean, we, we're in a world of hurt because of what these people are doing to Yahweh's creation. But these living waters, when Yeshua comes back, he's going to fix it. So I want us to take heart. Things are going to get dark and ugly. Things are going to get really bad. But Yeshua is coming back to fix it. Amen. It shall be that the living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea. In both summer and winter, it shall occur. It's, when he comes back, it's going to be good all year long. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth through Yeshua. In that day, it shall be. Yahweh is one, and his name one, Echad. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel to the king's winepress. The people shall dwell in it, and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague with which Yahweh will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from Yahweh will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together. Gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. Just like when we came out of Egypt. He's bringing the armies to bring the stuff to us this time. Such also shall be the plague of the horses and on the mule, on the camel and on the donkey, and on all the cattle that will be in those camps. So shall this plague be. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, because not everybody's wiped out when Yeshua first comes back. It's just the armies that gathered at Jerusalem. All these people that are left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh, of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles is the feast for the whole world. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, on them will be no rain. Because, as we're going to see, he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. Not everybody is serving him willingly. He's ruling with a rod of iron. They don't have an option, but it's not in all of their hearts. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which Yahweh strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's basically you do it my way or you don't get my blessing. Rain is his blessing. He will withhold his blessings on those that decide not to interact with his system of worship. You might ought to pay attention to it now, Christian. Learn temple worship because Yeshua is coming back to restore it. He's coming back to build the temple. If you read Zechariah 6, he is the man called the branch. We just read that. He's going to build the temple. And he's going to rule on his throne as a king and, his, and a priest from the temple in Jerusalem. So we might pay attention now and learn to worship the way that Yeshua did when he was here. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day, holiness to Yahweh shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in Yahweh's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to Yahweh. The whole city is going to be holy when the Mashiach's here. He scattered them from the city, but then he's drawn them back when he returns. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. And that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Yahweh of hosts. So Yeshua doesn't destroy all the wicked when he returns, like I said. In fact, he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. We see this from Psalms 110. Verse 1, a psalm of David. Yahweh, says the Lord in most English Bibles, says to Adonai, it says my Lord in most Bibles, but it's Yahweh in the Hebrew, and then Adonai, who is, and it literally means my Lord, Adonai, but it's talking about Yeshua. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 
Yahweh shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. See, Yeshua is still ruling in the midst of the enemies. He doesn't destroy them all when he comes back, just the armies that have surrounded Jerusalem. And now he's ruling in the rest of them. Everybody that took the mark of the beast, they're there. Unless they were in the armies, and then they're not there. But their kids have a chance. Because there's not going to be any more marks when Yeshua is here, other than the mark of righteousness and holiness. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Yahweh has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Adonai, or the Lord, is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. So he's going to execute armies, but then also he's going to execute kings in the day of his wrath when the kings make him angry. And we're going to look at another passage that kind of describes this to give us a little more insight. He shall judge among the nations. It's Matthew 25. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. But it's a process. It doesn't happen immediately when he returns. He has to kind of go over some evidence and then meet out the sentences. He's a just judge. Daniel 7, 7 through 14 says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet of it. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom where there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things, pompous things, it says in the King James. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. He's coming to deal with the thrones and the kings, but in the right time. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands, thousands ministered to him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. There's plural books. And in Revelation it talks about and the book of life. I beheld then. Because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, the pompous words, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, the other kings, the other nations, they had their dominion taken away. When Yeshua comes back, he's taken over. He's taken charge. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time because he's having to deal with them according to the evidence. And he's going to deal with them. But it's a process. It doesn't happen immediately. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the cloud of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Yeshua is coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will be ruling all nations with a rod of iron, and the former leaders who refuse to submit to his authority will be dealt with. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back to lay down the law. And it's Yahweh's law. It's in your book now. You better, better learn it because he's coming back to enforce it. It will be the constitution of the earth when Yeshua returns. So it would behoove us to study it now, to learn it now, to learn to walk in it now. Isaiah 66 says, thus says Yahweh, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says Yahweh, but on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word, and doesn't say it was done away with, nailed to the cross, tremble at his Torah, tremble at the fact that he's coming back to deal with those who have lied about his word. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. Because he hates swine's blood and he hates eating swine's flesh. You're defiling his temple. 
pigs were not made clean. And listen to what he's going to do to those that do this to him. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. It's an abomination, Christian. You might think it's covered by Peter's vision. Yahweh hates it. And he's telling you here, if you'll read his book, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Christianity and Judaism are what he's talking about and the perversions that go along with it. Now, his word, they both use the right book. His word is perfect, but they don't all follow his word. They follow the parts they want to follow and then they reject the rest of it and he is tired of you picking and choosing what you're going to follow and what you're not because you break one you've broken it all hear the word of Yahweh you who tremble at his word your brethren who hated you who cast you out for my name's sake because we're going to be persecuted they, he said if they persecuted me they're going to persecute you it's coming but he's going to deal with the ones doing the persecuting said let Yahweh be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The sound of a noise from the city, a voice of the temple, the voice of Yahweh who fully repays his enemies. They're not getting by with anything. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says Yahweh? Shall I, who causes delivery, shut up the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says Yahweh, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her sides, shall you be carried and be dandled on her knees as one whom his mother comforts. So I will comfort you and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of Yahweh shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. For behold, Yahweh will come with fury or with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, Yahweh will judge all flesh and the slain of Yahweh shall be many. Those, these are the ones that he's judging. Listen to this, Christians that like pork roasts and ham sandwiches. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst. Or it just says, the idol is in parentheses, it just says after in the midst. Eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says Yahweh. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come to see my glory. I will set a sign among them and those among them who escape, I will send to the nations, to Tarshish, to Pool, to Lud, who draw the bow and to Baal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. We're going to be evangelists when Yeshua returns. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Yahweh. Out of all the nations, on horses and in chariots and in leaders, on mules and on camels, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says Yahweh. Now, remember that scripture we read in Jeremiah just a while ago? Talked about the greater exodus, that this is going to be something so spectacular that you're not even going to remember the parting of the Red Sea or the ten plagues and all that stuff? That's the rapture he's talking about. Now, rapture comes from the Latin rapture, or however you want to pronounce it. It was in the Latin Vulgate, but it's the Greek word harpazo, and it means a violent snatching away. And when we rise up to meet him in the clouds and we are changed in the moment in a twinkle of an eye, and all of a sudden you have all these people that can fly like doves and light on the windowsill and walk through walls, you've got a hum superhuman race now. This is what he's talking about. So 
the ones that know him when he returns when we see him we're going to be as he is it talks about we were going to be changed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye and we're going to rise up to meet him in the clouds and we get the rapture express not to heaven because rapture has nothing to do with taking people from earth and taking them to heaven if you go back and you study you look in the greek about philip when he was with the ethiopian eunuch and then all of a sudden he was raptured to azotus it was one place on earth to another that's what the rapture is is taking you from one place on earth supernaturally beaming you as it were to another place so we're going to go up in the clouds and go back with him to jerusalem that's what the rapture is but we get a glorified body in the midst of that but the ones that didn't know him when he returned we get to go out and evangelize and they're going to bring them all back because they don't get their glorified bodies because when they see him they're going to repent and they're going to mourn as one mourns for a brother they're going to all receive him at that point but it's too late to get their glorified bodies early we that already knew him we get ours early that's our special reward for making it through the crap we're having to go through now the seeing the world corrupted and the mark of the beast and everything we're going to have to endure we get our glorified bodies early we get to be the super people amongst the mortals because of our faithfulness if you're faithful to the end it's still optional you don't you got to choose you got to choose every day am i going to stick with yeshua or am i going to go for this mark so i can feed my family because you're going to be faced with that choice and you're going to have to choose if you keep making the right choices even if they martyr you you're going to be resurrected and you're going to get a glorified body early and we're going to get to rule and reign with yeshua now the rest of the jews israel they're going to be brought back they're still going to have physical bodies they're going to have to be physically carted to israel but they're going to be brought back he's still going to have mercy on them because of the sake of abraham isaac and jacob as the children of israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of yahweh and i will also take some of them for priests and levites says yahweh for as the new heavens and the new earth which i will make shall remain before me because this is not the new heavens and the new earth yet this is the renewed earth when Yeshua comes back. He's going to remove the curse from other scriptures in Isaiah. So it'll be renewed, but it won't be new yet. It's not the new heavens and the new earth. He's going to make them. So shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says Yahweh, and especially for tabernacles, because if you don't, you get a curse there. But he wants us to all the time because he's wanting to you to get to know him and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched this is Gehenna the trash dump right outside Jerusalem is what it's painting a picture of but it's also where the lake of fire is going to be in the new heavens and new earth their carcasses are going to be there their corpse they're not burning up they're not going anywhere they're going to be there for all eternity as a reminder to don't do what the devil did see when lucifer fell there was nobody that tempted him he just decided to do it he's always going to leave us a reminder so that we will never make that stupid decision and he's going to leave it there for all eternity so we can see it for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh so this shows us the pattern for the new jerusalem as well as i said we're going to look at it here in a minute and see that we know nobody makes it through the great white throne judgment unless your name's written in the lamb's book of life everybody else is cast in the lake of fire yet as we're going to see there's wicked people right outside the holy city and if they didn't make it through the great white throne judgment where are they it's the lake of fire as we're going to see ezekiel 47 then he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water again this living water that Zechariah talked about there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east now the pollution they're doing right now it's killing the fish in the ocean it's making them toxic there's heavy metals and mercury all kinds of nasty stuff that's they're trying to pollute the air and the water and everything because the devil wants to kill Yahweh's kids it's not a conspiracy theory read the book it's listed in Revelation and other prophets then he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east and we know it's towards the west too from Zechariah but this is talking about the east flow in this one it's flowing under the right side of the temple south of the altar he brought me out by way of the northern gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faces east and there was water running out of the right side 
And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. And again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned, there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and on the other. Then he said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region, going down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. This water purifies all the pollution that man is doing right now. Don't be discouraged. I know things are looking bad, but he's going to fix it. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there. For they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Eglim, and it will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kind as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Along the banks of the river, on this side and on that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because the water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. It's almost a picture of the tree of life that we're going to see in the New Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord God, These are the borders by which you shall divide the land as an inheritance among the twelve tribes of Israel. Because see, he's dealing with Israel. It's all about the twelve tribes in the latter days. You don't ever see a mention of the church in the prophets, in the Bible Yeshua taught from, because there's no such thing. It's a mistranslation of the Greek word ekklesia in in uh, Acts chapter 7, Stephen, Stephen is talking about the church that was in the wilderness with Moses. It's the same word, ecclesia. That's the proper way to understand the church. It's the nation of Israel. It was born at Mount Sinai. It's not a separate entity of Gentiles that came about when Pentecost fully came. That's a lie. That's not what Scripture teaches. Ecclesia literally is the assembly in the Greek. The translators decided to take this word out of thin air and put church in there. It comes from a completely different Greek word that's not even in the text. It's not in any manuscript. It was invented by men as a replacement theology to make it look like this, quote, Gentile church has replaced the Jews that killed Christ. And that is a lie. Everywhere you read in the prophets, he's dealing with Israel. No church and no Gentiles. Gentiles are welcome to come in. But it's Israel that he's dealing with. Thus says the Lord God, these are the borders by which you shall divide the land as an inheritance among the twelve tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. You shall inherit it equally with one another. For I will raise my hand in an oath to give it to your fathers. And this land shall fall to you as your inheritance. This shall be the border of the land on the north. From the great sea by the road of Tuhal, he flown as one goes to Zidad. Hamath, Berota, Sibraim, which is between the borders of Damascus and the border of Hamath, to Hazor, Hidakon, which is the border of Harun, and the boundary shall be from the Sea of Hazar and Enan, the border of Damascus, as far as the north, northward, its border of Hamath. This is the north side. On the east side, you shall mark out the borders from between Huran to Damascus and between Gilad, or Gilead to the land of Israel along the Jordan and along the eastern side of the sea. This is the east side. The south side towards the south shall be from Tamar to the waters of Meribah by Kadesh along the brook of the Great Sea. This is the south side towards the south. So this, this is given the borders of Israel when Yeshua comes back. And it's going to be huge, a lot bigger than what it is right now. The west side shall be the Great Sea from the southern boundary until one comes to a point opposite Hamath. This is the west side. Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. No church mentioned here and no Gentiles. They're not part of his plan. Because there's no such thing as a church. And the Gentiles are to be converted. That's what dying and being born again is all about. You're born again as a child of God. You're not a Gentile anymore. You're, you're part of the commonwealth of Israel. 
It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. See, it's open for the strangers, but they have to bear children among you. And we know from Exodus chapter 12 that they have to be circumcised too to be considered native born. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. Now, does anybody know what tribe that they can't be grafted into? Miss Johanna knows. What tribe is it? Yell it out. Well, it's the tribe of Levi. Aaron was a descendant, and he was in the tribe of Levi, but you're exactly right. So you have to be born a Levite to be part of that tribe because they have no inheritance. They have no physical land that you can dwell with and get an inheritance there. So you can't be grafted into the priesthood. Not Aaron's priesthood anyway. And that sh it shall be that whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you will give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Now, these are the names of the tribes from the north border along the road to Hethlon at the entrance of Hamath to Hazar Enan, the border of Damascus northward in the direction of Hamath. There shall be one section for Dan from its east to its west side. By the border of Dan, from its east side to the west, one section for Asher. So it's almost like it's divided north and south, and then Dan's all the way to the east, and then Asher's the next one over, next to Dan. By the border of Dan, from the east side to the west, one section for Asher. By the border of Asher, from the east side to the west, one section from Naphtali. By the border of Naphtali, from the east side to the west, one section from Manasseh. By the border of Manasseh, from the east side to the west, one section for Ephraim. By the border of Ephraim, from the east side to the west, one section for Ruvain. By the border of Ruvain, from the east side of the west, one section for Yehuda, Judah. By the border of Judah, from the east side to the west, shall be the district which you shall set apart 25,000 cubits in its width and in length the same as one of the other portions from the east side to the west with the sanctuary in the center. So he's going to be building this temple. This is talking about Yeshua building the sanctuary. And that was actually the man who's called the branch is going to build the temple. That was in Zechariah 6. But in Ezekiel chapter 40, you can see the temple described from 40 to where we're reading here. The district that you shall set apart for Yahweh shall be 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width. To these, to the priests, the holy district shall belong. On the north side, 25,000 cubits in length. So the very north, it's the whole width, it's 25,000 cubits long. On the west, 10,000 cubits in width, so it goes down 10,000 cubits on the west, and on the east, 10,000 cubits, so it's, it's a rectangle, 25,000 by 10,000 cubits. And on the south, 25,000 cubits in length. So the sanctuary of Yahweh shall be in the center. It shall be kept for the priest of the sons of Zadok, who are sanctified and who have kept my charge, who did not go astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. And this district of the land that was set apart shall be to them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. So there's going to be Levites, and they're going to be by the priest. But these priests are the sons of Zadok. And then the other Levites that sinned and, and followed Absalom and some of these other things, these are the ones that don't have the same level of holiness, but they're still there. Yahweh's still faithful. Opposite the border of the priests, the Levite shall have an area 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 cubits in width. Its entire length shall be 25,000 cubits, and its width 10,000 cubits. They get the same section size, basically. And they shall not sell or exchange any of it that they may not alienate this best part of the land, for it is holy to Yahweh. So this is what's coming, guys. You might want to study this out. This is what Yeshua is setting up. The 5,000 cubits in width that remain along the edge of the 25,000 cubits, because it's 10,000 plus 10,000, so it leaves another 5,000 cubits left by 25,000 cubits long. These shall be its measurements. The north side, 4,500 cubits, the south side, 4,500, and the east side, 4,500, and the west side, 4,500. The common land of the city shall be, to, to the north, 250 cubits, to the south, 250, to the east, 250, and to the west, 250. The rest of the length alongside the district of the holy section shall be 10,000 cubits along the district of the holy section shall be 10,000 cubits to the east and 10,000 to the west. 
It shall be adjacent to the district of the holy section, and its produce shall be food for the workers of the city. So Yahweh's going to have his own people growing their own food right there for the city when Yeshua is here. That's going to be a righteous plan, not like this one that Klaus Schwab's wanting to do where we're going to have four big districts all over the world and just a bunch of garbage. Satan's trying to counterfeit what Yahweh's going to do, but Yeshua's going to come back and fix it all. Amen. The entire district shall be 25,000 cubits by 25,000 cubits four square. You shall set apart the holy district with the property of the city. The rest shall belong to the prince, who we know, according to Zechariah 6, is going to be operating at the temple. It's Yeshua. On one side and on the other of the holy district and on the city's property, next to the 25,000 cubits of the holy district as far as the eastern border and the westward next to the 25,000 as, as far as the western border adjacent to the tribal portions. It shall belong to the prince. Now, it talks about he's going to raise up unto Jesse a righteous branch. And that's what this prince looks like it's going to be. Now, in Ezekiel, it calls the prince David. So it calls him David instead of the offspring of David. So whether it's David or Yeshua, one of the two, it's, it's going to be one of the two guys. It shall be the holy district, and the sanctuary of the temple shall be in its center, right where the prince has, because he's going to be ruling on his throne as a king and a priest, Zechariah 6 tells us. Moreover, apart from the possession of the Levites and the possession of the city, which are in the midst of what belongs to the prince, the area between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin shall also belong to the prince. So Judah stops here, and then Benjamin is going to take off over here on the other side of this 25,000 cubits square. And then the, the prince or owns everything that's around it, and then Benjamin starts to the west of what the prince owns. By the border of Benjamin, from the east to the west, Simeon will have one section. By the border of Simeon, from the east side to the west, Issachar shall have one section. By the border of Issachar, from the east side to the west, Zebulun will have one section. By the border of Zebulun, from the east side of the west, Gad will have one section. By the border of Gad, on the south side towards the south border shall be the Tamar to the waters of Meribah by Kadesh along the brook of the great sea. So we've got the, the Israel, we've got Dan on the east side. From north to south, it looks like, and then Gad on the very far west next to the sea from north to south. So it's going to be split up a little bit different than it ever has been along the brook to the great sea. This is the land which you shall divide by lot as an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. And these are their portions, says the Lord God. Now, check this city out, Jerusalem, that Yeshua is going to build during the thousand year reign. It's very similar to the new jerusalem and the gates that are going to be there and it gives us the order and what tribes are going to be which gate these are the exits of the city on the north side measuring 4,500 cubits the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of israel the three gates northward one gate for reuben so he's probably on the far left one gate for judah and one gate for levi so you've got the children of of uh, leah on the very north with judah in the middle so the very northern gate is Judah's gate in this city that Yeshua is going to build. On the east side, 4,500 cubits, three gates. One gate for Joseph, one gate for Benjamin, and then one gate for Dan. So like Dan's on the very far east in Israel, he's on the east side of this holy city as well. On the south side, measuring 4,500 cubits, three gates. One for Simeon, Shimon, one for Issachar, one gate for Zebulun, and that's on the very south. On the west side, 4,500 cubits with three, their three gates, one gate for Gad. So just like Gad was on the very far west side next to the sea, he's going to be on the west side of the city too, his gate. One gate for Asher, one gate for Naphtali. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits. And the name of the city from that day shall be Yahweh is there. Because Yeshua is going to be there with Yahweh in him, ruling with a rod of iron. And that's the name of the city. And it's a precursor to the New Jerusalem, laid out just the same way. So this holy city is a preview for the thousand years of the New Jerusalem on this earth. And now we're going to read about New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, 
and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This is the new heavens and new earth, and everything else is done away with. Then he said to him who sat on the throne, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. I will give to the fountain of the waters of life freely to him who thirsts. So now we've got fountains of life, water coming again, this living water, just like was there for the thousand year reign. And this water is going to give us life freely, the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. That's the key. We have to overcome. We have to stand. We have to endure. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Wouldn't you like to know who the bride of Christ really is? The church today will tell you it's them. That's not what it says here. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Now, this is a living city. Peter talks about how we're being built as a temple for the most high as living stones. We are literally part of this city. The holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great high wall with 12 gates. We just read about the 12 gates, didn't we? The north gates is what? Reuben, Judah, and what was the other one? Reuben, Judah, and Levi. That's what it was. So that's going to be probably the same way it's going to be laid out in the New Jerusalem. The three gates... On the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west, just like the city we just read about. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, who were what? Jews? Israel? Is there any church gate? Is there any Gentile gate? Not in either one of the cities. Not in the one Yeshua is going to be ruling from, and the one that the new heavens and the new earth. That city, no Gentile gates and no church gates, because they're not there. You're either grafted into the line of the tribe of Judah or you're one of the nations left back at home actually you're still grafted into the Judah but you just because you didn't embrace all the covenants you're not going to be part of this holy city but there are nations as we're going to see there's nations that are saved for all eternity they're back in their homelands but they're not part of the lamb's wife there's an intimacy that we can have if we understand that the other nations are not going to have the city is laid out as a square its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. And then he measured its walls, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man. And that ties in with the 144,000 that are going to be bringing in this harvest. That is of an angel. That's probably a pretty big cubit. My cubit's about 20 inches. And I guarantee you, if it's a pretty good size angel, it's going to be a lot bigger than that even. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysolus, chrysolophase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. That was a big oyster that made them. And the streets of the city was like pure, was pure gold, like transparent glass. So gold is so common in heaven that he paves his streets with it. It's not any big thing to Yahweh to get us some, if we need it. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Really, the whole city is the temple. 
I mean, we're living stones built for a temple for him, and we're there, and he's there too. But there's no, like, official temple that we all go to now because we're there. We're, we've made it. We're with the Father, who is what the temple was all about. We're with the Lamb. That's what the temple was all about. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. His glory is so intense. We don't even, he shines as bright as the sun, at least, maybe probably brighter. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Now notice, these are nations that are saved, but they're not part of the city. But they'll walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Because they're not part of it. They have to bring their glory into it. But there shall be no means enter in it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's all that makes it through the great white throne is those that are lit, written in the Lamb's book of life. Except, look at this next chapter. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. It's just like the one we read about in Ezekiel. Proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life on either side so there's more than one tree of life it's like the picture we just saw which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month just like we read in ezekiel because the water the living waters comes out of the temple when yeshua is here the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations we just read that in ezekiel except that's a precursor it's not actually the new heavens and the new earth that's what is getting us ready to understand what's going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God. See, there's curses in, during the thousand-year reign. You don't come up to Jerusalem, you get it cursed. You don't get any rain. But there's no curses here because this is all past that now. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. They shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. We've got glorified bodies. Now we can see His face. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must come shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to, to me, see that you do not do that. This is an angel. He's just a normal angel. He's not supposed to be worshipped. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren of the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. He who is unjust. See, he told Daniel to seal the book till the time of the end. But this is saying, don't seal this, because we need to know this information. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. See, you're going to be in the same condition when you get to this point. There's no more time for repentance. If you hadn't made the right choice now, it's too late. Let him who be filthy be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work, not according to the words of his mouth. Well, that's going to be one of the things he judges us by is every idle word, but it's the work. It's not the talk that we're talking. It's what we actually do that he's going to judge us by. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside, now remember, this is after the great white throne, but outside this great city are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Where are they? They weren't supposed to make it through. They're in the lake of fire, which is right outside the city where we're going to view them as we go into the city where their worm dies not and their, their corpses, I mean, their, their worm dies not and their fire is not quenched. That was a precursor. The lake of fire is right outside the holy city to remind us, don't you ever even consider turning against Yahweh. If Satan had that, he would have never turned. So we're going to have that so that nobody ever makes that mistake again. 
I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you that these things in the assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. It's available to us now by the spirit. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Yeshua, the grace of our Lord Yeshua Messiah be with you all. Amen. Things are getting ugly in the world today. But the answer is almost here. Let's keep our eyes on the answer, not on the problems, not on the storm, but on the solution. He's here to take us through it. We're going to see some ugly, ugly things. Our lives are going to be cramped. You think Noah had a lot of fun staying in an ark for a whole year with a bunch of smelly animals? He was preserved. It wasn't a lot of fun, but he was preserved. So what is going to be for us. And then when we're all done with the test, it's going to be heaven on earth for all eternity. Look at Matthew 24, 1. Then Yeshua went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Yeshua said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon the other that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Yeshua answered and said to him, Take heed that no one deceives you. Because they're, they're going to try. There's these false prophets and these lying shepherds that he warned us about in the first thing that we read. And they're going to try to deceive us. But he says, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Messiah. And will deceive many. It wasn't soon after he left that Bar Kokhba came on the scene. And Rabbi Akiva declared him as the Messiah. And there have been hundreds of them since that time. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. World wars were predicted. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. We're seeing that now. And a lot of this famines and pestilence, man's bringing on themselves. With all this stupidity, this geoengineering and stuff they're trying to do. All things... All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Now that hadn't happened yet, but it's coming. And he's warning us about it now. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another. Because they didn't heed the warning. And will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And it's, they're on the scene now. And because lawlessness will abound. That's the Greek word anomia. It means to have abolished the law, to say that it's been nailed to the cross. He's talking about you. If that's you, pastor, that says the Torah was nailed to the cross, the law of Moses, you're lawless. And because that will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And that is agape in the Greek. And only believers have that. He's talking about believers. Love is going to grow cold because they were lied to because they're lawless. It says of many, and actually that can be translated in most. Most believers are going to grow cold. Their, their love's going away because they're lawless. Because the Torah is all about God's love. All of it hangs on the two greatest commands. It's about loving God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. The rest of it's the details on how we're supposed to. What Yahweh expects us, how we're supposed to do that. He gave us the details. He doesn't leave it up for just whatever we think is going to be pleasing to him. He said letter by letter, word for word, he dictated to Moses everything he wanted written. Moses got the scriptures in a unique way. Nobody else ever got it like that. He says, with other prophets, I speak to in dreams, visions, and dark sayings. But with Moses, I speak to him face to face, mouth to mouth, even as one speaks to a friend. Apparently. But he who endures to the end shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom not the watered down christianity that's been spread but this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a witness to all nations 
and then the end will come. It's spirit and, and truth. Christianity is taught worshiping in spirit really well. They teach about how to love their neighbors. I mean, Sister, was it Mother Teresa? She was an awesome lady that helped a lot of people. Matthew 25, judgment, she would have fed Yeshua. She would have washed it. She would have done all the things that he's judging them by in Matthew 25. But when you come to Matthew 7, even though she was doing all these good works, just like when they come before him and they say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We did mighty works in your name. They're, they're loving their neighbor really well. But what is his answer? Depart from me. I never knew you because you're lawless. You didn't know how to love the Father. Because of the, the ceremonial parts of the law that they say were nailed to the cross, that's all about loving the Father. If you take those away, you can't love the Father. And he's going to have to tell you to depart because you didn't do what he said to do. And it's in the book. Everybody has it now. Way back then, you had to go to the synagogue to hear the Torah scroll read. Now everybody's got the word on their phones. You don't have an excuse now. You've got the word instantly at your fingertips. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. We've got a job to do. We've got to bring Mashiach back. We've got the word to preach into all the nations. We've got the true full gospel now. He shared it with us. It's spirit and truth. We've got to be born again. And we have to walk in obedience. That's the two. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Where was that? We just read it. The valley of the mountains of Azal. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. You better have your preparation done because you don't even have time to grab anything if you're on the rooftop. You've got to immediately go to that place of protection or you're going to be taken. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those that are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time nor ever shall be. And this is what we're facing, guys. We're going to see tribulation like we've never seen it before. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, which means we're here for our sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah or there, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets that we just read about, the lying shepherds, the lying prophets, will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The false prophet's going to call fire down from heaven. That's the sign of Elijah. He's going to fool a lot of Jews. The Antichrist is going to sit himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, and he's probably going to go by the name of Jesus Christ, and he's going to fool the Christians, a lot of them, the ones that don't read their book, which is most of them. But he's not going to be able to fool the remnant. They will deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. What does that mean? We'll remember in Ezekiel 39 and also in Revelation 19 where he slays Gog and Magog or what we know as the Battle of Armageddon. And he calls the birds of the air to come partake of the flesh of kings and captains and mighty men and horses and all this other stuff. Wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. He's talking about this war coming immediately after the tribulation of those days. Right after he wipes out Gog and Magog and makes his great supper for the birds. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Rapture time. Except we don't go to heaven. We meet him in the clouds. We get glorified bodies and we go back with him to Jerusalem to rule and reign with him with a rod of iron. Let us be those who endure until the end because that's the only way we're going to make it and be able to be with him is we have to endure what's coming. 
So this message is, it's not to depress you. There's going to be a lot of darkness and a lot of crap we're going to have to go through. It's to encourage you because Yeshua is coming back and he's going to make it all right again. And he's going to build a temple and we're going to be with him for all eternity. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the honor of being your people, being your children, being grafted into the body of Mashiach, being containers of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, you not only created us in your image and your likeness to begin with, you redeemed us after we fell. And then you came to live in our hearts by faith. Father, help us to all endure. We know hardness is coming. We know things are coming that the enemy's going to try to get us deceived. And if it were possible, even the very elect will be deceived, because some of them will be. We've already seen it happen. Some of our brothers have already stumbled and fallen with goofy doctrines like the flat earth and, and lunar Sabbath and some of these goofy things that he's already twisting them, making all these divisions. See, if you don't get revelation directly from him and speak as what he's put on your heart, you're adding to the problem. If you're just studying the Internet to learn how to put your message together, you're part of the problem. Yeshua is coming back for a bride and for a people who have no spot, and no wrinkle. You can't be preaching lies from the pulpit and expect to make it, Pastor. You better get back to the book and teach only what Yeshua taught because he is the prototype. We are all supposed to be like him. Father, have mercy on us. Bring us conviction. Draw us back to you to repent, to be like Yeshua, who is the prototype of what we're supposed to be like. We are all supposed to be being conformed to his image and the way he worshiped, he set the perfect example. He was the perfect man, the perfect Jew. And if you do everything he did, you will be perfect too. And if you don't, you won't be. Father, let your people know that we need to be like you. I thank you for giving us these warnings because it's out of great love and compassion because you're not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But you give everybody the choice and you will honor everybody's choice whether they were deceived or not. Those that did things worthy of stripes will be beaten with many stripes. Those that knew not but still did things worthy of stripes will be beaten with fewer stripes, but the beatings don't take place in glory. It's the place of torment. So please come to that place of repentance. Embrace Mashiach. Embrace his Torah. Embrace his Holy Spirit and all of his gifts. He wants us to make it, but we need all of his equipment if we're going to. Father, I thank you that you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, p'navelecha, v'hunecha. Yesah Yahweh Penavelecha Vayasim Lecha Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. I love you, brothers and sisters. Go with Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. You'll be able to stay around and eat, brother.